Hello, my name is Dakota Keen, and I'm a landscape architect and partner at Methune uh, on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, also known as Seattle, Washington. And we are here today at Suquamish with Robin Littlewing Psycho. I'll let you introduce yourself, Robin. Okay, great. My name's Robin Littlewing Saigo. I'm a member of the Suquamish tribe, and I have been working in the field of um, museums. Well, I mean, as an adult, I have um, an undergraduate degree in cultural anthropology, um, but really my, my training in working in museums uh, began as a child because my dad worked in um, the Suquamish Museum, and so I learned um, underfoot. I was there all the time, and so it's just been a joy to kind of work in in that field and really recognizing, you know, that part of where those buildings, where that landscape really makes sure that there's a really firm connection between that landscape as well as our cultural landscape, our home. Thank you. So some of the projects that we've worked on together over the years, um, one that we're working on right now is the House of Awakened Culture expansion. Um, we've also talked a lot about the Suquamish village um, and your vision for this holistic place um, and the museum as well that you just mentioned. So um, all of the questions that I have for you today surround some of the work that we've done together um, and some of the um, ideas that we've explored together when we presented on panels and um, and uh, shared our, our mutual interests. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, surrounding living culture and and the landscape in particular here at Suquamish and um, recognizing that we're here on your ancestral lands on the Salish Sea. Um, and when we started talking about the idea of expanding the House of Awakened Culture and the need for um, that indoor-outdoor connection, a place to be on the waterfront, you brought up this idea of um, connecting it to the sacred beach, Duque Watts. And so we went out two years ago or so. I remember that day because it was misty and smoky and it was just this ethereal experience. Um, and I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about the qualities of a gathering, of gathering in a sacred space like that, that can be expressed in design. Um, how can a design be imbued with the sense of a place like that? And when does it make sense to do that intentionally? And when does it make sense to let it evolve more organically? You know, place is so important. And, and I don't know a time when place wasn't important because mm -hmm. I have been fortunate to grow up on my ancestral lands. And, you know, every time my dad would take us somewhere, it was like, oh yeah, you know, we grew up over there or we used to go clam digging over there or we went berry picking over there. So I get to have that sense of place all the time. And that sense of, um, I feel like sometimes the best word for it in the English language is, is magic. Mm -hmm. that, that feeling when you're like, you know you're in the right place, you know, that time and space and everything brought you to this one spot and you can smell the moss, you can smell the fresh air, you know, there's just that sense of like, I know I'm in the right place mm -hmm. that it's meant to be. And so when you're creating these places, these physical structures, this place, these gathering places, like how do you make sure that you're going to give the people visiting there that same sense? And I think that that's the piece that it's hard and easy at the same time, right? Like everybody wants to feel that. So you know that you want to have that place of gathering and you know how you want it to feel, but getting there takes some time and the bureaucracy of, you know, the details that go along with getting there can sometimes um, pollute a little bit that process. So how do you make sure you're hearing everybody's voices and then you're kind of following that, um, that stream to where you need to go? And I think that that's one of the gifts that, that you come with and that I've really enjoyed working with you on is that you've been able to help be some of that momentum to get us there. Um, so I want to ask you um, 
to the um, segue that you were mentioning, the work that you've done um, here in Suquamish Village and around this area, um, and thinking about this reclaiming the spaces between the House of Awakened Culture and the museum and starting to really um, be intentional about making sure that, that those spaces are for tribal members. Um, and I'm curious about, um, can you speak to the importance of that continuous connection from the cultural elements to gathering spaces in every place in between. Why is that an important priority? And how has it changed the way that the community sees and interacts with the village? So there's several things um, to bring up there and I, I'm getting excited about talking about it. <laughs> um, but I, I think to start out with some history of the land right there where the House Awakened Culture is, where the museum is, that those were spaces that um, our tribal council back in the 1950s and 60s had to make the difficult decision to lease that land out mm. to non-natives um, to get some money so that we would be able to go back to D.C. and advocate for our land, for our environment. And we lost that land for a long time. Mm -hmm. For 50 years, yeah. we didn't have access to that land. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and at the time, when we leased that land out, the developers of that land had told the people moving onto it, they're like, oh yeah, it's not a big deal if you build a house here um, on this leased land because this tribe won't be here in mm. 50 years and you'll just be able to buy this land for pennies on the dollar. And um, But we knew that wasn't true. We knew that we were waiting. We knew that we were growing something. Um, to make sure that we were strong and ready for that. Mm -hmm. So that land just came back to us mm -hmm. in the last four or five years. And we got to wake up this June 1st morning, mm -hmm. the day that that lease ended, to a beautiful day, a beautiful sunrise. Uh, we hosted a breakfast down at the House of Awakening Culture and um, just got to celebrate what it meant to have this land come back. Like mm -hmm. it felt like, you know, like, like a child being in foster care and then all of a sudden it gets to come home. And so so for that reason alone, like welcoming this land back was really important. And so that land where the House of Awakened Culture sits, uh, part of that was land that we held in trust before that, that wasn't part of that lease. Mm -hmm. But part of it was part of that lease. And we there were some really amazing neighbors, non-native neighbors who um, either sold back their land to the tribe early, mm -hmm. um, that lease, um, or um, they gifted it mm -hmm. back. And so it was really, I mean, so for all of those reasons, it has a very special quality to yeah. it. So to have that land reunited um, makes it even more important that we maintain that connection of it, that that continuum as we were talking about a stream earlier, like what is it to walk that path and know that that path is all Suquamish land, mm -hmm. to know that it's all connected through not just the ancestral piece, not just the physical piece, but also the part where us as a community, us as a tribe, have intentionally come up with a way to design this mm -hmm. so that it meets the needs of the community. So they get to walk along that path and feel that gathering area where we hold celebrations, where we hold funerals, where we hold um, tribal commute journeys, mm -hmm. as well as walking up and getting to see the Veterans Memorial, mm -hmm. where they get to see the playground, you know, to really facilitate that um, joy and connection between um multi-generations to the spot where you're up at the museum yeah. to them where you get to go to the government mm -hmm. I mean all of those things are so important to what we're doing wonderful thank you um I mean a lot of the elements that you just mentioned has to do with displacement and reclamation um and healing um and I want to turn to the topic of some of the amazing programs that you have um just spearheaded and instituted here and um i there's really nothing more than i i love to talk with you about these topics because you could take a seemingly unrelated topic of a fashion show sovereign style 
that I had the pleasure of attending with my daughter and my niece at the House of Awakened Culture before our pandemic, um, or endeavors that you are working on, such as finding Indigenous ways of healing um, from mental health issues, and thinking about those seemingly disparate elements and recognizing that they're radical acts of activism and they are directly connected to, um, to land and place. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind briefly describing those programs to the degree that you're comfortable, since I know there's some new elements um, coming, and just thinking about how they do relate to cultural landscapes around um, Suquamish. Um, and I think you see them as radical anti-racist acts, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on why. So, right, and at first, I don't think I ever really thought of them as... Um, as acts of activism mm -hmm. and having, you know, grown up in an activist family who always had those, like, I always felt like activism and maybe fashion were something, were things that were two separate things. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, as I got older, I realized that was not true, right? Like planning the outfit you're going to wear for, <laughs> to go to a protest, you know, is really important. It speaks volumes, right? You see all these people like making these signs, you see them making shirts, you see, you know, a million women wearing uh, pink pussy hats and you're like, I know you. It's this connection, right? This this moment of recognition that connects us. Like, I see you and we have this thing in common and we are fighting for the greater good. And we're not just fighting, but we're loving and we're connecting for the greater good. Mm -hmm. And that's what these spaces end up being, mm -hmm. right? And so much of it ends up being a healing part of it because there's so much to heal from but the amazing part is and having you know worked here at the uh with this my tribe this Quamish tribe for the last 24 years I actually get to see all of the healing that's happened and really get to focus then on not just the immediate healing needs but also that reclamation of joy mm -hmm and that reclamation of laughter together. And that part that, you know, it's it doesn't have to all be like we're working in a chaos mode. We're now working on the long haul. Mm -hmm. We're working on building the joy. We're working on um, anti-racist language that's going on. We're making sure that, you know, our, you know, new um, or younger generations that are coming up that they feel free to express themselves in terms of gender, in terms of who, who their voices are. And so making sure that we have a space for that is so vital. Making sure that they have those places where they get to be themselves. Whereas we had generations that didn't have that. And so mm -hmm. now we have this wonderful space of show us what you got. Mm -hmm. like. And I think that's one of the great parts about the House Awakened culture, right? And one of the things we wanted to do when we're looking at the expansion is host more people mm -hmm. in there because it's bursting at the seams, well, at least pre-COVID, it was bursting yeah. at the seams yeah. during some of these coastal jams of people just expressing who they are. Okay, my last question, and I just want to leave folks with um, some thoughts on potent takeaways for understanding ways of, um, back to the idea of reciprocity, but as it is in the context of the design process. And we've talked a lot about how it's unique to Indigenous communities um, in terms of trust building, two-eyed seeing, which is the idea of taking and honoring traditional ecological knowledge and pairing that with Western science, um, and that those two things can be intertwined um, for as a guide for design. Um, building trust, having meals together, all the things that we have done and value. And as I started thinking about this, I mean, it's it's not exactly a new idea, but this should be the model for all design. <laughs> it should really, really not be oh, unique really, to indigenous really communities. Um, but in all of the processes that we've done together and any other design processes that you um, have witnessed or been a part of, I guess my question for you is, that reciprocal model of design as opposed to the extractive model. Um, 
what are the most potent takeaways for what you think how non-native folks can approach um, methods like these? So I, it's something that comes naturally to most people, right? Because if we reckon, if we recognize, and um, I won't go off on a whole big capitalism thing here, <laughs> but a lot that we have here in America has to do with this idea of kind of a blanket like American culture, when really this is for people aside from Native Americans mm -hmm. is a land of immigrants, a land of bringing um, those um, villages here. And the point I and I just came back from a trip to the UK and mm -hmm. where I did this big road trip and it was amazing to see all these different um, villages. Like all of a sudden you just come mm -hmm. up like nothing for so long and all of a sudden there's a village and there's a pub and there's you know the horn carver who's just like sitting out there and to pull over and start talking to them and I was reminded of how much we end up losing when we focus on a nuclear family mm. as opposed to a multi a multi-generational family mm -hmm. and a multi-community family mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and that people want to connect so much. And so this process of getting to see what was going on over in the UK, over in Ireland and over in Scotland, mm -hmm. where I saw people just like lean in mm -hmm. to these conversations. And when I would ask questions about, oh, you know, how long ago was this church built? They know the answer to that because mm -hmm. that's a really important part of where they are. So wherever you go, people have those senses of things. It's, you know, it's that process when somebody, um, when, when your neighborhood grocery store changes the layout and everybody gets really <laughs> cranky because they're like, this isn't where it goes. Where is the soy sauce? <laughs> you know, and it's really hard. And then you have somebody else who comes along and they're like, oh, it moved over here. Let me show you. This is really hard for me too. <laughs> And this whole process of finding places where you get to connect over a landscape, right? Mm -hmm. Something that you think you know, and then it changes, and then you can't even remember when it used to be something else. Even in right? a very short amount of oh, time. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think that those are the places where we get to help each other to the next step. And that doesn't, that's not native specific. That's, that's human nature. Thank you. I feel so connected to you. Every time I speak with you, it's more and more. Oh, I feel the same way. I was so Thank excited so to do much. this today. Yes, <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Yep. Mm.